Okay, lesson 38 with the last uh, section of the philosophy of the Kleshas according to Patanjali chapter 2 Sutra 20 The seer is pure consciousness but though pure appears to see through the mind. The seer, that is your soul, Purusha. The seer is the entity in you that is omniscient. Omniscient means knowing everything far beyond what you have learned from your parents, from your education, from the media, beyond your conditioning. But it's on a very high level of consciousness, therefore very, very subtle, and most people in normal daily life functioning they have no consciousness at that level because the energy is just not there. Only once in a while when the circumstances are favorable we have a short moment of such higher consciousness and then for a long time we don't. As a yoga practitioner you are more and more functioning on that high level of consciousness. But there is a huge dilemma, and that is described in this sutra. Purusha is pure. It's all-knowing. The ancient people practice science in this way, through, through the seer. That is how they discovered the universe. That is how they built a pretty good picture, pretty good insight about our solar system and what's far beyond. Not perfect, but based on pure uh, contemplation. So far beyond anything that they could have learned from a teacher or a book or anything. It's also how they developed insight in atomic structure something that is invisible to the eye without sophisticated um, uh, tools, technology, that didn't exist. We have the same ability to view, to see, far, far beyond what we have been conditioned to know. You have these insights, you have epiphanies, totally new insights. And as a meditator, a contemplator, you will have this more and more. You will become a scientist in your own might or in your own right. A scientist of what? Of life. It is how inventors have revolutionary new insights in technology. Something that has not ever been invented before in the history of mankind. A real inventor, in a moment of contemplation, sees a possibility, sees a construction that nobody ever thought of before. So you can, you apply this in, in your work. If you love your work, you will naturally do that. You're passionate about what you do. You will apply this in daily life. Life is a huge project in itself with everyday new situations and surprises and what have you. 
but we are facing a problem here. That is, although this consciousness, this seer in us, is pure and all-knowing, it is being interpreted and translated by the mind. And that is reflected in this sutra. The seer is pure, however, it appears to see through the mind. And it's even more complicated than this, because if you look at it like, if you look at it as follows, you have you have Ashna Chakra, which is your mental capacity. The seer is above that, which has very sensitive anten antennas in connection with the universe, where all knowledge is stored. So if you throw the wish out to know something and you contemplate, you will receive information. But it is the mind that interprets, that conveys that information. It is the mind that extracts concrete information from that feeling. Because inside is a feeling, is a vibration. It's not a thought. It's the thought that tries to understand the feeling. But this is not the only entity that we live with. We have. We have five more energy centers that each deal with their own level of uh, consciousness that constantly that constantly provides us with input, fear, uh, um, emotions, ego-related and ambition-related issues from the heart, passion, compassion, enthusiasm, love, and from the throat. And the mind, many people, although highly educated, are not even capable of interpreting this properly. Very often we brush all this information aside and the mind is determining everything that we, that we think is important, leading to chaos, leading to conflict, Of course, the sutra is not about the lower five chakras, but just to indicate, it's not, not that simple. It's not only the information from Purusha that um, there is a limitation in, in interpreting that properly, but there is much more that pollutes the process. Towards the end of the handout, the solution is given. And the solution simply is meditate more because it is in the meditation that you are pure enough and sensitive enough and conscious enough to get to the essence of what you're looking at beyond beyond the conditioning of the mind beyond the conditioning or the pollution of the condition of the mind and if throughout life you regularly engage in practice of yoga, including meditation, you will see that that condition becomes more and more natural. You will have this ability without having to sit in a meditation for an hour or so. It will just happen throughout your daily life. You become contemplative, not only when you contemplate, but throughout the day and even the night. Sutra 21 The very being of the scene is for his sake. 
And God created the world for man, as is written, not only in the Bible, but also in other holy books. Patanjali says it in this way. The very being of the seen is for your sake. God or the universe gave us a wonderful world, the earth. We talked about this before. There are not many places in the universe where the circumstances are so perfectly balanced that it allows organic life to manifest. We are organic life. And the fact that we manifested in this body, in this physical matter, is, is unique, is a miracle. Because the circumstances at this earth, on this earth, are so perfectly balanced that it allowed organic life not only to manifest, but to evolve to rather uh, sophisticated levels of organic life that even develop consciousness, like uh, the human species has developed consciousness. This realization of this miracle for most people is lost. We abuse the, this wonderful, carefully sculpted, balanced environment. And, well, it's very current, a very current issue these days is how we are destroying the environment and we are kind of on our way to destroying it beyond repair because we are totally disconnected from nature we do not many people not everybody many people do not realize that we wouldn't be here without this wonderful earth with its amazingly uh, precarious balance that allowed us to be here in the first place. Out of greed we destroy the earth. We pollute, pollute the air, the water. We dig huge holes in the ground to, to, to get something out of it that we then can sell for profit and what have you. And it goes to a point that we are, we are kind of putting our own house on fire without knowing that we are putting our house on fire. But once that house has burned down, there is no place to live anymore. So this kind of text in any kind of holy book, that is an appeal to every uh, conscious human being to realize the miracle of it all, to ask for respect of it all, and to ask us to take care of it, to take care of the world that we live in and its creatures. And when you are aware of that, it becomes a holy duty. The well-being of other human beings, but also that of, of other beings, other animals and what have you. You know, I've lived in Yoido for 12 years and um, the great thing about it is you have the rivers out there, you can make long walks and I was once walking with somebody next to me and my dog, the other dog before, and at some point I told her, look, there are so many ants. There is a period in the year that the many, many ants are uh, 
they are crossing the path. I said, look, there are so many ants, please don't step on them. And she looked at me and she said, you're joking, right? So I said, no, no. Yeah, Everybody is walking there and busy with their things. And, and uh, even if they know that they are squashing those ants, they don't care. But each of those ants is a being. They have a family. They have a purpose. They are going from A to B with a reason. They have a purpose. They have something to do. Like you go to the supermarket or visiting family or... And by the way, we made that road there in their territory. They are only crossing that road because we destroyed that part of their territory. And she was, she was that person had a special uh, place in my life. She was my student and she helped me to take care of, of my administration when, um, 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 when I separated from my partner in 2008. Uh, who, who took care of uh, most things. So she, um, she kind of opened up to the idea and thought, oh, yeah, yeah, Corona. Hanguma no Corona. Corona. They can be, oh, okay, yeah. I never thought of it like that, but you, yeah, you may be right. <laughs> it's this just the realization. It will come naturally to you. It will come natural, naturally to all of you. Patanjali is only uh, uh, confirming that it is right, that it is correct, that it is just that we... It's not ridiculous to care about these tiny little ants. They have just as much right, or maybe even more than we do, to live on this earth and in this environment. And that applies to every other. Um, plant and animal alike, and every other being. Strange, huh? But that is where your consciousness will take you in the long term. Because we're all the same in the end. We're all God's creatures. Sutra 22. Although it becomes non-existence for him whose purpose has been fulfilled, it continues to exist for others on account of being common to others besides you. Can you make something out of this? If you have a child, child is born, and you are a parent, you see your child every day, you don't see your child grow. If, however, this child is your nephew or niece and you visit once every year or six months, every time you visit, you see the child grew a lot. Strange, how is this related to this sutta? Well, you started practicing yoga and you felt something. That is why you become intrigued and you, you pursue that. You want to learn more. What you don't realize is that you transform. Your consciousness opens up gradually. Your heart opens up gradually. Gradually you change and you transform. You grow, you evolve. But like that child that is your own child, because you are with yourself every day, 24 hours a day, you don't see it happening. But the changes are real. And that is what Patanjali is saying here. Although it becomes non-existent for you, whose purpose has been fulfilled, it continues to exist for others on account of being common to others. As a result of your increasing consciousness and sensitivity, you become aware of things you were not aware of before, and people who do not go th through the transformation that you are going through are not aware of. 
Now this is what happens. You continue to change, increase your insight and consciousness, and then you start to see how imperfect other people are. Forgetting, forgetting that there was a time when you were just as imperfect as them. And then people become arrogant. It's an arrogance that you see very often in spiritual circles, where people truly think they are superior because they belong to a certain spiritual practice or cult or group or what have you. Patanjali is saying, have compassion for those who were not as lucky as you were to grow, open consciousness, transform, change, and evolve. Do not forget where you're coming from. Do not forget that there was a time where you were just as ignorant as those people that you are now looking at and, and, and judging. It is an appeal from Patanjali to stay humble and open your heart. Instead of being judgmental, try to understand. Because you've been there. You were just as ignorant as, as they are now. And you are privileged, in fact, to have found a way to climb out of that dark hole of ignorance. That can be considered one of the diseases of the disciple. That you, your change has come so gradual that you haven't seen it, but what you do see in the present is that you, that you are kind of standing above other people in terms of consciousness. You know, very strange, but increasing consciousness and sensitivity leads to common sense. In English it's called common sense. I say common sense is not common at all. Most people are lacking common sense because they are lacking consciousness and sensitivity. So you develop conscious consciousness, you develop common sense. But then you start to see that other people are lacking it and it will start to irritate you. It will start to make you angry. Oh, how can those people be so stupid? Can't they see? No, they can't. What you forget is that there was a time that you couldn't see it either. And it's very important that you remind yourself of that. Sutta 23. This, together with Sutra 16, one of my favorites. Remember Sutra 16? The misery that has not come can and is to be avoided. This one. The purpose of the coming together of the Purusha and the Prakriti is gaining by the Purusha of the awareness of his true nature and the unfoldment of powers inherent in him and Prakriti. Purusha is the soul. You, your soul. Prakriti that is the world around us, the world of matter. The purpose of the coming together of the Purusha and Prakriti is gaining by the soul the awareness of your true nature and the unfoldment of powers, the manifestation of abilities, qualities, characteristics inherent in you. The world is your playground. The world is your playground. Play and learn. The whole thing that yoga is suggesting, yoga is not telling you to suddenly start behaving like a yogi. 
yoga is not suggesting that you withdraw yourself into a temple or a monastery or whatever, isolating yourself from the daily from daily life in the real world, in society. Yoga is suggesting to continue life, but from now on doing it consciously. And if you do that, every experience in life will help you to grow. That is what this sutra is saying. And I have been saying from the very beginning of this course, all your experiences, especially those that you consider negative, your failures, your conflicts, your, your misery, your suffering, we have a tendency to drown in those sentiments, negativity. But Patanjali is saying, no, this is happening because you're ignorant. Use them to climb out of your ignorance. Use those experiences to learn. Learn about yourself and the world around you. In the long term, it will lead to your liberation. It will lead to your enlightenment. It will lead to the end of your one million lives that you have to live through suffering karma so that you can go up into the light, so that you can go up into heaven and not be reincarnated anymore. The world is your playground. Many people look at philosophical texts like that from yoga and from other uh, 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 sciences of life also, so, uh, esoteric sciences, in a, very, in a very nihilistic way, in a negative way. But if you read between the lines, it has a very positive message. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to withdraw yourself and deny yourself all the worldly pleasures. But at least start doing it consciously. Then your heart will show you the way. If you enjoy worldly pleasures, your increasing consciousness will show you what is harmful and what is not. And when it is harmful, you avoid it. You try to get rid of it. If it is beneficial, then you keep that into your life. Life doesn't have to be like, like a fakir, like an acid who denies everything about life and, and flogs themselves on the back with a whip to atone for their sins and what have you. That is not the message of Jesus Christ, it's not the message of the Buddha, it's not the message of any of the philosophies and religions as, as we know them. It's just a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of, uh, of the text. Here, the world is your playground, but start playing consciously so that instead of misery, you gain growth and development from it, insight and wisdom. Wonderful message this. Go on with your life, do it consciously, and you will see that it will change. Why were the knower, how were the knower and the known unified? Why, why did our, why did our Purusha, our soul, fall from paradise and manifest onto earth only to suffer every day? That is because of, well, Patanjali says, the cause is the lack of awareness of the real nature. We're disconnected. We have no soul consciousness. It's dormant, it's asleep. It's not awake, it's not manifesting. So, ignorance. Ignorance is the reason why we fall from paradise. If we were, if we were omniscient, if we were all-knowing, we wouldn't have fallen from paradise in the first place. We fall from paradise out of ignorance and we are given this world to live in, to experiment in, to experience in order to grow and develop the insights and wisdom to go back up there into paradise again. Sutra 25. 
So how can we deal with this problem? How can the knower and the known be separated? The dissociation of Purusha and Prakriti, the disconnection, the disconnect, the dissociation of Purusha and Prakriti brought about by the dispersion of Avidya is the real remedy and that is the liberation of the seer. In simple language, get rid of ignorance. Get rid of ignorance and you become connected again. You solve all your misery. But how do you do that? How do you get rid of ignorance? Sutra 26. How do we get rid of ignorance? The uninterrupted practice of the awareness of the real is the means of dispersion. In simple language, keep your eyes open. You started practicing yoga and you notice that you become more conscious, that you are more sensitive. You see more than you did before. See. But you're not seeing all the time. Your energy is constantly fluctuating between higher levels of consciousness and lower levels of consciousness. And every time when you're functioning on lower levels of consciousness, ego kicks in or fear spoils the fun, or there's just a, a bout of ignorance that, that causes again uh, some form of, of suffering, of misery. So Patanjali says, keep your eyes open. Don't be stupid, keep your eyes open. The alertness of the deer is constantly on the lookout for danger. We have to try to be more and more alert. Do not fall asleep anymore. How do you do that? Patanjali has an answer for everything. In our case, the highest stage of enlightenment is reached by seven stages. Which one? Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Prachahara, Dharana, Dhyana. After a long story, Patanjali says, practice yoga! <laughs> and keep practicing because it is your yoga practice that provides you with the energy in the crown chakra that will make you alert as a deer that will keep your eyes open and be on the lookout for possible danger you will become more and more alert and that will allow you to anticipate situations that have not even happened. And then you go back to Sutra 16. The misery that has not come can and is to be avoided. And there will be time and time again, there will be moments that you can't avoid it. But then you sit down and smile and say, oh my God, I did it again. Stupid me. I should have continued my practice. You will always know what the reason is for your misery. That in itself is a reason for misery. Practice, practice, practice. And then we end up with the last sutra. Fifeka Kayati, which is the, the, the question asked before the sutra start. How can we develop Fifeka Kayati? Vivaka Kiyati is the ultimate awareness, the ultimate alertness. How do we develop that? From the practice of the component exercises of yoga on the destruction of impurity arises spiritual illumination which de develops into awareness of reality. This sounds very impressive, intimidating maybe, 
But the practical meaning of this is that practicing the seven steps of yoga leads to the eighth step, samadhi. That is a natural condition. There are some techniques we can apply to superficially start samadhi. It's something that we do in the advanced course, in the third module of the advanced course. But in the end, samadhi is a condition that is based on your regular practice of yoga. It's not a technique, it's a condition, a state of mind, a state of consciousness, I should say. Not mind, but consciousness. So, how do we get rid of ignorance and how do we obtain um, Viveka Kiyati, the, the alertness of the deer? By practicing those self steps on a regular, systematic basis, have the discipline to continue practicing regularly, then spiritual illumination which develops into awareness of reality will occur. You will become omniscient. You will become all-knowing. And that is how you avoid uh, not all misery. Because if you can avoid all misery 100%, you wouldn't be here in a physical body. You would be up there in paradise among the other souls that have reached that highest stage of development. But you can avoid a lot of uh, suffering and misery that you were not able to avoid before. If only you practice your yoga regularly. And you know, it all sounds very complicated and we are only human. Um, if you think about yoga as only uh, being like this, um, you may not uh, you may not be very motivated to actually practice regularly. Enjoy your practice. Every time you, every time I I fell in love with yoga after just one time doing some stretches, but in a, in a proper yoga way, with a basketball coach. It felt so good that I immediately, I became intrigued. That feeling in my heart was so strong and everything after that was led by that feeling. I went to the library, got the book and I started practicing that evening, every evening. So at least six evenings per week. There are so many, apart from the good feeling, and apart from the promises that Patanjali gives us here in terms of being able to avoid lots of our uh, misery, uh, suffering, conflict and what have you, it just feels incredibly good in the moment to, to just turn off all your devices, TV, radio, phone, dim the light and just close your eyes and go on that trip. It's just I became addicted to yoga because of that, that wonderful feeling. For the first time in my life, I felt connected with myself. And your body changes. You become a second god of beauty. It makes your body nicer. No, it won't be perfect. You won't be on the front of the Vogue magazine or uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Universe, whatever. But you see your body change, and that, that, is, that, is, that feels good. You feel the increased strength in your, in your arms, in your legs, and, and you go up and down the stairs and what have you. Everything becomes easier and lighter and what have you. That in itself, it's just one of the side effects of yoga, but, but that only that would be enough reason to keep practicing. You can focus on the physical aspects and see the spiritual aspects as a side effect. Patanjali turns it around. It's not about the physical at all, according to Patanjali, or Svatmarama for that matter. It's all about consciousness. And then having many other side effects, also uh, 
also physical. But practice and find motivation to practice in, in simply in how you feel. If you practice traditional yoga properly, it's just such a good feeling. It's incomparable with the modern yoga that you have these days everywhere. It's a good exercise, no, no doubt about that. But it's not as addictive, it's not as, as, as enchanting as traditional yoga really is. You practice yoga correctly, it becomes, it becomes the highlight of your day. It has always been for me, the highlight of the day. It's something you look forward to every day again. And it empowers you to do the impossible. Move to the other side of the world leaving everything behind. <laughs> Not knowing where you end up. <laughs> Questions? This is the conclusion of uh, the philosophy of the Galatians. And the end conclusion really is practice, practice, practice. Okay, don't forget that practice starts on the mat and on your cushion, but in the end, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Daily life situation become your yoga. You become yoga, yoga becomes you. That is the true fusion, unity. Every situation has a potential to teach you something, to to show you something, to make you conscious of something. Things that you were not aware of before. Okay, let's have a short break.